Hi, everybody. Am I live? Well, thank you all for coming. This is great. Let me find my clicker. That's just, it's really fascinating. This is my first intersection with Arup, which is a firm I've known about for many years. But the fact that Arup, which to my knowledge is the best engineering firm in the world, among other things, um, has identified walk, walking and walkability as a key criteria for success of your communities is very meaningful to me. So thank you for that. And thank you to the Committee for Sydney and um, also Consult Australia, which brought me here. This is my third talk today. But it's definitely going to be the best, because you've all had a beer. <laughs> and the others didn't. And I've had a beer. <laughs> so it's, I don't know how it's going to go, but I'm going to remember it as the best talk of the day. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, the subtitle of my book is, has America in it. And I wrote it for America. And I was kind of surprised to see the interest that I've received in, in other countries. I think it's important to tell you, as I've told my other audiences today, that I'm kind of counting on you to interpret the things I say a as appropriate to your own situation. I have to say there are tremendous similarities, I think, between the Australian situation um, and the American situation. Um, <clears throat> but the main thing I have to say, probably, in my two visits to your country and having talked to a lot of people, learned from you, virtually visited different places in Google, is that, and I said on the radio this morning, um, that you're the, I think the typical Australian city is as good as the best American city, and the typical Australian suburb is as bad as the worst American suburb. Um, or the typical, sorry, the typical, sorry, the typical Australian suburb is about as bad as the worst American suburb. So you, you, um, you've embraced suburbia in the same way we have. Um, it's tough for me to come to Sydney, which is a city which is actually more walkable than almost every American city, and tell you about walkability, but one of the, as an American, but of course, being an American, and having traveled the world and lived in lots of different places, um, as these folks I'm sure have, um, I do think that I can be somewhat objective in describing the, the, the situation. So let's get right to it. That's just my screensaver. Um, and uh, the talks I give are usually called the walkable city, sometimes I talk about why we need it, and sometimes I talk about how to do it, and tonight I'm going to try to give you a bit of both. The why we need it talk is uh, about the um, experience I had as a planner where my colleagues before me and I uh, spent many years, them perhaps 30, me 20, kind of shouting into the wind about, from, from a planner's perspective and an architect's perspective, a designer's perspective, about why we needed to make more walkable uh, places. And seeing a limited amount uh, of interest and uptake and, and some change happening, but then experiencing, really over the past 15 years, three other groups who people listened to more than they were listening to us, um, who were essentially sharing the same message, but each from their own separate, separate hymnals. Um, the ec economists, the environmentalists, and the epidemiologists. And um, a big thing that I do in my book and in my practice and in events like this is to share their messages because actually these are the messages that have been much more um, uh, um, effective in causing change in policy and change in practice in at least American communities. The economic discussion, it's kind of a sad story and a happy story. The sad story is what happened in the US and I'm sure to a certain degree here. Um, in 1970, the typical American spent 10% of their income on transportation. Um, between 1970 and 2010, we basically doubled the number of streets and roads in our country. And as a result, we, we now spend 20% of our income on transportation. And, and what this number reflects principally uh, is the decision we made uh, collectively and enthusiastically um, to burden ourselves with mandatory automobile ownership and use. You know, the, the <coughs> story that was told that if an alien were to come visit the Earth and observe um, what was occurring on the surface, they would think that the dominant species were these uh, two-ton steel vehicles that had these parasitic, uh, fleshy things that went in and out of them. Um, but the very fact that we've chosen to uh, have most of our people do most of their travel in single occupancy vehicles has been a tremendous burden, such that the typical uh, working family, as defined by the federal government, is now spending more for transportation than for housing, and 
poor Americans, as so defined, are spending 40% of their incomes on transportation. That's an outcome of the landscape we've created, um, the, um, which looks like that. The other side of the discussion, though, is what happens when a city, and you know, our best city in the US for this is Portland, which I should say pales next to Vancouver, which probably isn't so different from Sydney. So I mean, we still have some catching up to do. But what happens when an American city chooses to not focus itself as much on driving? And Portland, Oregon is this wonderful example of a city that um, stopped investing in roadways. They, um, or at least new roadways. They invested $65 million in bike facilities, and uh, which, by the way, was half of what they invested in repairing one cloverleaf, but it's a lot of money. Um, so they, they put a lot of money into bicycling. They created an urban growth boundary around the city, um, which no other American city that I'm aware of uh, did. And they invested in light rail and a, basically a trolley system that connects to a light rail system that was really regionally quite effective. And these three things that happened kind of beginning in the 70s and, and into the 90s, um, by 1996, the um, <coughs> travel times in, or vehicle miles traveled, or vehicles kilometers traveled, in Portland peaked and have been declining ever since, which is I think the only American city where that's happened, um, such that the amount of money spent on transportation in the city uh, is they're saving $1.1 billion a year, which is 1.5% of GDP. And interestingly, um, they're commuting 11 minutes a day, less than they used to, uh, which per person is 46 hours per year. So that's a significant change from a city that, you know, in global terms has done not that much, but certainly on American terms has done a lot um, to invest in a non-automotive uh, environment. And then there's kind of the other story, which is probably the one that Portland talks about a lot more, which is that young, educated talent is moving to Portland in droves. In fact, you know, PhDs are now baristas because they don't have enough jobs for all the PhDs that are moving to Portland. But the kind of hidden story, of course, is it isn't just that it's economically wiser to um, unburden your population from being tied to the automobile. It creates the kind of city that people want to be in both in terms of it being a great physical place and it, also be, and it also being kind of hip and fun and attractive as a place to live. So that is a very short version of the economical discussion. The environmental discussion is pretty straightforward. Um, nowadays when we talk about the environment, we're talking mostly about climate change and the impacts of things like um, Superstorm Sandy, which you know, nailed New York pretty badly. And um, it's, um, uh, when you think about the environmentalism in the US and the history of it and the Sierra Club and all the different stages of, of that movement uh, um, or that ethos, it's been a historically anti-city ethos. Environmentalism has usually looked to cities as the source of the problem. And there's a long-standing American, I would say, anti-urban ethos that began, well, at least was well known with Thomas Jefferson who said, uh, cities are pestilential to the health, to the liberties, to the morals of man. If we continue to pile upon ourselves in cities as they do in Europe, we shall become as corrupt as they are in Europe and take to eating one another as they do there. Um, and that message was only, was only driven home, this anti-city environmentalism message was only driven home more strongly when we started producing these carbon maps, which you know, carbon, CO2 per square mile, make it very clear, this is Chicago, that the center of the city is the hottest and the suburbs are, the, are cooler and the exurbs uh, are the coolest. So if you, the clear message here is that, you know, the further you are from the city, the lighter your footprint. Until a uh, very smart economist about 10 years ago said, what if we measure CO2 the proper way, which is per household? Because there are only so many of us in the country at any given time we can choose to live where we have the lightest carbon footprint. And when you measure per household, as you can see, the maps just flip. And the message is very clear. You know, the further you live from the city center, the bigger your footprint. And then you have folks like Ed Glazer, who wrote Triumph of the City, telling us, you know, we humans, we're a destructive species. If you love nature, the best you can do is stay the hell away from it and live in a city. And the denser, the better. And so this concept of location efficiency. And I spoke a week ago, and Adam was there. Where's Adam? Eco District's Adam was there. 
and um, talked about how I, I was at the, it was the Green Build Conference, and everyone, like any Green Build Conference, was talking about gadgets and buildings and vehicles and all the ways that they can have less of an impact. And my main point was, yes, that all counts, but really what counts the most is where you choose to live, and beyond that, how you design your city. So um, that's the environmental message. Finally, the epidemiological message. Um, I like to say the best day to be a planner in America was August the 7th, 2004, when this book was published. And three epidemiologists, three doctors, whose specialty was public health, realized that we, well, they, they were quite aware that we had this epidemic of obesity in the US. And of course, the obesity isn't the problem as much as all the illnesses that it causes. And the um, discussion for so many years had been about diet. You know, the horrible American diet, the huge size of our portions, the food deserts for healthy food that we have in our cities. And these guys said, no, actually the problem is not so much what we're eating, but the fact that we have environmentally induced inactivity that we have engineered out of existence in our communities, in our communities, the useful walk. And people are no longer getting exercise um, for that reason. The idea that you could drive the car to the parking lot to get on the escalator, to get to the gym, to get on the treadmill in order to walk is what's fundamentally wrong with our country. And it's the reason why we have the first generation of Americans who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents. So not only do we have an epidemic of bad health based on inactivity, but you can chart it geographically. And we now have areas around every city, and it's typically the, ex, the ex-urban ring around every city that's defined by the medical community as obesogenic, as causing people to be unhealthy. So um, that's the, the epi epidemiological argument, and it's an effective one. And these three arguments, then, are driving policy, and we understand why we need to have more walkable cities. And by the way, the 16-minute version of that talk can be found on TED. Um, if you Google my name, which has a K at the end. So uh, you might want to see that. But just read my book, that's better. Um, so uh, more importantly, if I'm leaving you with helpful hints, is uh, not just why we need it, but how to do it, uh, which is what I call the general theory of walkability, a little tongue-in-cheek. Um, but it is actually a theory, which is a hypothesis that's continually being tested and modified. And what the general theory of walkability tells us, oh, and it's kind of the organizational structure of the most, the bigger part of my book, is that you know, in America or Australia, in which driving is quite cheap, you don't pay the full cost of driving by a long shot. Actually, if you own a sedan, four-fifths of the cost of driving are owning the car, and only one-fifth is driving the car. So the fixed costs are huge, and the variable costs are very small. And the smart thing to do is to drive it as much as possible once you own it. And every mile costs less than the mile before. And it's parked there in the driveway between you and everything. So in these circumstances, if we're going to get people to walk, then the walk needs to be as good and as pleasant and as, and as effective as the drive, which means we think it has to do four things simultaneously. And this is a, it's a hierarchy, but actually you, you, you can't leave any of them out. Uh, the walk has to be useful. It has to be safe it has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting. So I'm going to take you through those four steps, and when we're done, we'll have most of the picture about what, what makes for more walkable places. The Useful Walk is a story I learned from my mentors, who you may have heard of or heard speak, uh, Andre Stwani and Elizabeth plater Zyberk, DPZ of Miami, who kind of created the new urbanism movement. And I discovered them when I was um, not yet even in architecture school. And Andres used to give a talk that he called um, the story of, of planning. And it discussed how in the 19th century, people were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills. And the planners, who weren't yet called planners, said, hey, why don't we move the housing away from the mills? And of course, lifespans increased immediately and dramatically. And the planners were hailed as heroes. And we like to say they've been trying to uh, repeat that experience ever since. <laughs> so you have the onslaught of Euclidean zoning, the separation of the landscape into large areas of only single use, where retail is separated from offices, separated from medical offices, separated from low, medium, and high density housing. Each gets its large area. And um, we planners now know this is wrong. They don't teach this in school anymore. But most of your areas in this country and in our country um, have maps upon them that still look like this that must be undone if you're going to plan something that is walkable. And uh, I like to tell people I was an art history major, which they say is of limited value. 
Um, but I say, you know, you don't want a Rothko, you want a Syrah. <laughs> and Syrah was the pointillist, right? The f if you're going to zone by use, the finer grain of conf you know, confetti-like zoning that you can do, and of course our most walkable place statistically is this one, and even this red color, it's misleading because this red color is vertically mixed use. But if you're going to zone by use at all, and of course nowadays we're trying to zone more by form, building form, size, and uh, type rather than the use of the building, um, you do want your uses to be as tightly grained as possible. Which leads me to the principal argument I try to give wherever I go and another story I heard from Andres many years ago, and the reason I got into this business was to learn, to realize that actually there's only two tested ways to build community in the world and throughout history. There's a thousand ways to make a city, but there's only two ways that we've tested by the thousands. And one is the traditional neighborhood, and the other is suburban sprawl. The traditional neighborhood, which was the only thing we built until the middle of the 20th century, um, is defined as being compact, diverse, and walkable. This is a few neighborhoods of Newburyport, Massachusetts, near where I grew up. Um, each neighborhood, in, and this happens in Newburyport and almost anywhere you study, each neighborhood tends to be about a five minute walk from the edge to the center, which means about a half mile across, and you find that somewhat universally. There are places to live, places to work, places to worship, places to shop right there, places to recreate. Much, uh, many, if not all, of your daily needs are located within walking distance. That's what planners call diversity. You hope for a diversity of people, but you need a diversity of stuff before you get that. And then it's walkable because there's, oops, there's lots of streets. So no one street needs to be very big. <clears throat> and I'll explain more about that in a minute. This is sprawl. Unlike the traditional neighborhood, which, have, which evolved naturally in response to man's needs, uh, sprawl is an invention and celebration, and we all were celebrating the automobile in the mid-20th century. It's clearly not compact, thus the name. It's not diverse. Whole square miles will hold just one use, or in some case, just one house, over and over again. And it's not walkable because so few of the streets actually get you anywhere, the loops and the cul-de-sacs, those few streets that do connect become overburdened with traffic. All the traffic must sit on these few streets that are quite far apart, and they become sized and designed entirely around moving as many vehicles as possible. We call them traffic, se traffic sewers. Um, they're noxious like sewers. You can see these houses all turn their backs to them. There's not a single address on these streets. And so while you have a, a lot of streets, the, you still have the phenomenon of what we call the cul-de-sac kid. You know, who's perfectly safe and content on this little street, but around the age seven, you want the child to have some independence, and you give them an allowance, and you say, here's five dollars, you know, spend it wherever you want. And they say, thanks, can I have a ride to the mall? Because they cannot leave this precinct. They're locked in this little section, because the, you would never let them out on these, nox <laughs> on these noxious streets. So it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, where you only shop, and the kind of the missing part that we forgot to count when we separated everything from everything else and reconnected it only with automotive infrastructure is our federal highway system, which was designed for commerce and for vacation travel, has become essentially a commuting way. Um, so I always tell people, you know, for some, this is the American dream, um, but it's a two-part dream of the dream and the nightmare often to absurd extremes of how we invest in our um, horizontal environment. And the idea that, you know, why does this look this way? Because it's level of service F and unacceptable if you have to sit for two light cycles in this intersection. It's completely unacceptable as a planning principle that you should have to sit here for more than 60 seconds because it is so banal that you want to shoot yourself. And so that's determined all of our funding. And we rob our vertical infrastructure, you know, our schools look like insecticide factories because we're putting all our money into the horizontal public realm. The experience, of course, is <laughs> not all that fun. This is not Photoshop. Um, it's stressful on our families. And part of, the, part of the epidemiological argument was a social health argument. Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone uh, uh, demonstrated, he's a Harvard demographer, he demonstrated that uh, for every 10 minutes your commute is longer, you are 10% less likely to participate in civic life. 
And a more recent study showed, yes, people have, people have more affairs in cities, but they're more likely to get divorced in the suburbs. And the further you are, the longer your commute, the more likely you are to be divorced. Um, so, you know, it's no fun to be a driver. Being a pedestrian can be even worse. Um, so this is the model. These are the models to understand. And this is, <coughs> these slides are flawed because housing is missing, strangely. And I need to fix that. Um, but you can see that it's the same stuff between the, <coughs> the sprawl model and the neighborhood model. It's a question of how big the stuff is, how far apart it is, and then what is the street network? Is the key kind of technical thing to understand is it's the distinction between a dendritic network, a branching, dendritic means branching network, where you always go from the local to the collector to the arterial to the highway and back again, to the network of small streets. And the great irony of sprawl is that, you know, this was created entirely around automobile use, yet it's worse for automobile use. Because if you have one engine fire or breakdown on this collector road, the whole city shuts down for an afternoon. Whereas, of course, here there's many paths from every destination to any other. So these are the two diagrams to think about as you consider new places being built. And most of my talk is going to be about existing places and making them better. But I'm kind of concluding the, um, the future development episode by reminding you that these two diagrams really tell you what those two models are. And then, of course, it's particularly relevant as you release new land. And that's an interesting term. We don't use that in the US. But it's state land, and the state is releasing it for development. And um, my fear, my, my actual, uh, I'm, I'm sadly confident that there is not enough rules in place to push you to this model from that model. And when you go on the website and look at the vision for what you're going to develop, it's what you've already developed. And uh, this is better than our sprawl. Look, there's some nice bike path, big sidewalks. There, you know, houses are actually facing it. But this is principally a dendritic network with big blocks and uh, lacking the, um, the fine grain walkability that you'd see in a place that will end up being walkable. The second category, which is the big one and where I will spend most of my time tonight, is the safe walk. Um, for a number of reasons, it's the thing that most cities and communities can fix the fastest, so it's really important to talk about it. But also, most of the places, at least in America, that could be walkable, if they're not walkable, it's probably because the streets just don't feel safe to walk up against. This is the key thing to understand. A car going 35 miles an hour is eight times as likely to kill you uh, hitting you than a car going 25 miles an hour. So that cusp, that 30 mile an hour cusp, um, is super important. And the question is, are we designing our streets and our public spaces in order to encourage cars to go higher or lower than 30 miles an hour? And in most of the US, and I would guess here as well from my observation, we design it for higher speeds, and then we, we post speed limits, and then occasionally we ticket people who are speeding. But in fact, every aspect of the built environment is telling people <laughs> what speed to go, and we're often doing it wrong. And people aren't even looking where they're going anymore, so <laughs> it's really important to do it well. The first of these items is block size. The smaller the blocks, the more walkable and safe a place, a place is. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200-foot uh, blocks. This is Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, famously 600-foot blocks. Some of these intersections, they give you orange flags. There's a little basket in a light pole of orange flags that you hold up when you cross the street so you won't be picked off um, by a motorist. Um, here are the two models side by side, quite astonishingly um, different. And the main lesson here is that a 200-foot block city can be mostly a two-lane city. And a 600-foot block city is mostly a six-lane city. 24 different California cities were studied when the block size doubled the number of fatal crashes not on highways almost quadrupled. So it's important in your existing cities, don't let hospitals and universities and other organizations um, super block. Don't let them combine <coughs> blocks together. As you do that, you, you make the streets less safe. Next is the number of lanes. And this is a discussion that pertains both to highways and to city streets. But the <coughs> understanding of traffic planning that still pervades the the public consciousness, and to a certain degree the profession, uh, that we now know is wrong, is that if you 
increase the capacity of a roadway or a s system to absorb the traffic that is anticipated and in this case causing congestion, the understanding is that that congestion will go away, which of course never happens. And what happens is this, and the gap between prediction and reality is what we call induced traffic or induced demand. And it's because of the fact that, as I suggested, you do not pay anywhere near the full cost of driving. And therefore, you drive as much as possible. It's like economists say, you know, economists say about parking, of course there's never enough parking. If pizza were free, would there be enough pizza, right? It's the same thing with lane miles on your streets. When you reduce congestion, you actually reduce the one constraint that was keeping people from driving. In congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. And when you reduce the congestion, people move further away from work, they commute more right on peak, they choose not to carpool, not to bike, not to take transit, and so we find this happening over and over again, whenever we've done it. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. This is in Newsweek magazine, hardly an esoteric publication, and when I read this, I jumped up and down for joy, and then I landed and said, um, who are these engineers and may I please meet some of them? Because the typical engineer that I was working on with most of my projects would say, you know, you need to make that street wider because the traffic is coming. And then you make the street wider and the traffic comes and they say, see, I told you, you needed to do that. But of course it was the street that induced the traffic. We now know this um, from a study that was, it's called the Fundamental Law of Congestion. It was presented at the Paris School of Economics. Very straightforward. Actually, I have no idea what this means. Um, but I do know what this means, which is what the data says, which is that when, uh, to, to the degree that you add new capacity to a system, immediately 40% of that capacity is taken up by new trips on average, and within four years, 100% of the capacity is taken up. In the U.S., what we accomplish, what those cities that spent more on capacity accomplished was they lengthened everyone's commute. They spent more, and the traffic got worse. So, it also works backwards, and this is particularly relevant to some discussions here. This is the Embarcadero Freeway that was damaged in the Loma Prieta earthquake and had to come down because cars couldn't drive on it anymore, and they decided it was too expensive to rebuild. And so everyone predicted a Carmageddon, you know, a, a total traffic nightmare. Please come in quickly. <laughs> um, they, predicted, they predicted that, uh, you know, we'd had this incredible traffic nightmare when this street came down. Now, of course, they didn't just take the street down, they built a beautiful boulevard, and they put trolleys in the boulevard. And what happened, of course, is there wasn't a single day, except for the day of the earthquake, there wasn't a single day of traffic congestion because people naturally adjusted their behavior. This happened with the Embarcadero Freeway, it happened with the Central Freeway, also in San Francisco, and it happened with the West Side Highway in New York, it happened with the Chong Ye Shen Expressway in, uh, in Korea, and it's happened over and over again. People adjust their behavior in both directions. You end up with an equilibrium of exactly the amount of congestion that people are comfortable with. So that's an important lesson. Now, I make this point wherever I go. And by the way, I'm picking on the engineers, but typically the engineers understand, but the citizens don't. And the engineers are getting phone calls, getting phone calls every day from the citizens who say, please add a lane to my street because I can't get to work fast enough, right? So it's more of a public perception discussion, and that's why like, I always have this conversation and then I move on, because it's so hard to win. But what is easy to win is identifying, and in some streets, in some cities it's, it's more than in others, identifying opportunities where actually supply of lanes exceeds demand for lanes, where you don't have congestion. So this is Oklahoma City. You can see a lot of lanes, not that much congestion. And the mayor came running to me about a dozen years ago because in Prevention Magazine's issue on most walkable cities in America, they named Oklahoma City the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country, which kind of stinks to be called that. And the mayor said, what do we do? And I said, let's do a walkability study. And he said, what's that? And I said, I don't know, but we got to do one. <laughs> and I've since done 14 of them all around the U.S. Um, and uh, we looked at the downtown grid, which was a nice little grid, and we looked at the car counts in their streets, which, you know, the Oops, sorry. The streets look like that. And we looked at the car counts in the grid, knowing that a two-lane road will handle 10,000 cars per day. No engineer will dispute this. And we looked at these counts of 6,000 and 9,000 and 4,000 and 5,000, and we realized these were streets that were designated as, as arterials in the brand new downtown plan, and they were going to be rebuilt 
at four to six lanes. 10,000, eight, five, five, four. We said there's a serious disconnect between <laughs> your supply of lanes and your demand for lanes. And actually, we can take a lot of asphalt out of these streets, and you won't have any congestion. And happily, um, the day that I released my study, Devon Energy decided to build a 60-story tower in the heart of downtown that was going to generate $200 million of tax increment. And they said, what can we spend this $200 million on? I said, I know. We're going to rebuild every street from building face to building face in this 40-block urban core. And my job actually was to design the curb to curb of all these streets and right-sizing it to the amount of anticipated traffic, not current, but anticipated with some growth. I was able to double the amount of on-street parking and uh, create a bike network where there was no bike network. So a street like this, four, four lanes, um, becomes two. Here it is under construction. Uh, this street, which was the principal arterial through downtown, needed to be four lanes plus a turn lane at the corner, but we managed to put a median in. And then it's a little bleached in this projector, but there are bike lanes <coughs> on each side as well. <coughs> this is what you do if you have money. And it's not a good example to show to cities because most cities don't have a couple hundred million extra kicking around. The much more common situation I face is places like Cedar Rapids, <coughs> Iowa, where they had the farm boom and the farm bust, and these four-lane streets in the downtown were carrying about one-third of the cars that they could hold. And we looked at their grid and said, oh, you've got Salt Lake City streets, but you've got Portland blocks. And they were about to spend $3 million to rebuild in a very pedestrian way, sorry, pedestrian-friendly way, this one street, just one street. I said, why rebuild? With $3 million, you can restripe your, your whole downtown. So don't rebuild, restripe is my motto, because you get so much more done for the same amount of money. And so we turned this system of half one way and mostly four lane to this system, which gave us a parking count going from here, where red is angle parking instead of parallel, <laughs> to that, and a bike system going from here to here. And they decided not to spend the $3 million. They just took their regular operating budget, and as streets were coming up for repair, they'd been slowly restriping them to this new system. And of course, no congestion, no problems. So number of lanes is important. Next is the width of the lanes themselves. Andres Duani showed this slide for years, and he'd say, the typical road to the typical subdivision in America is wide enough to allow you to witness the curvature of the earth, which is true, um, because the standards have changed. So here's a street from the 1960s, and from the same height, here's a street from the 80s. 1960s, these are both outside of Washington, 1980s. There's been this mission creep. The standards get wider and wider and wider, somewhat inexplicitly. This is my old neighborhood of South Beach, this street wasn't draining properly, so they had to rebuild it. And in so doing, the new standard kicks in, and we lost half our sidewalk and all our street trees, even though it worked perfectly well before. The problem with wider streets is that people go faster on them. And you know, if you're in a four-meter street, a four-meter lane, that's a highway lane. That's a 70-mile-an-hour lane. Forgive me, you can do the kilometer translation. If you're in a 10-foot street or a 3.1, actually, yeah, 3.1-meter lane, that, that's a 30-mile-an-hour you know, lane. You understand this intuitively, and you adjust your behavior to the lanes that you're driving in. The severity of impact of a 4-meter lane is 10 times a 3-meter lane. So the question I ask seeing this and understanding that the studies have been done is, you know, when do we learn? When do we change our behavior? And, you know, we've shown in America that we are at least until recent years, we'll see that there, we're being tested right now. We're a corrective, a self-corrective society. You know, and now almost none of us smoke, for example. But, um, but this 12-foot lane standard is still present in many of our cities. So I like to quote, you know, we're a religious country. I like to quote this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life, which is true. <laughs> this plays very well in the South, actually. <laughs> Uh, the next element is, uh, as I've mentioned, is parallel parking, an often undervalued asset. Not only does it, is it necessary for most shops, but parallel parking is a barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. And if you don't believe me, this is Fort Lauderdale, famous for its happy hour. 
This is the parked side of the street. This is the unparked side of the street. This is happy hour on the parked side. This is happy hour on the unparked side. No one wants to sit or stand or walk, and you have this experience a lot in, in very walkable, otherwise walkable Sydney, of cars coming very close to you at speed um, because there's no barrier of parked cars. And of course, the other barrier is the street trees. Engineers for years fought the street trees. They called them FHOs, fixed and hazardous <laughs> objects. Another thing that adds danger to the street. street. But in fact, <clears throat> when studies were finally done, they found that along streets that had segments that had no trees and segments that had good trees, the segments with the good trees, there were fewer injury accidents than the segments that didn't have trees. Because of course, trees are one of many things that cause drivers to to proceed more slowly. They slow cars down, some, <laughs> sometimes abruptly. But better to hit a tree than a pedestrian. So this is what some of your streets feel like, you know, when there's no parallel parking, no trees, and you're walking against that uh, dangerous flow of vehicles. Um, signals are one of the few things that I think Australia struggles with more than we do, um, particularly Western Australia. My experience in Perth and Adelaide is you come to an intersection and you actually have to wait. These guys go, these guys turn, those guys turn. Like 16 different things happen and finally you get this brief opportunity to cross the street. You definitely don't want push button signals. Do you have push button signals? Yeah, yeah I mean, you shouldn't have to ask for a light. That's an insult, right, as a pedestrian. But push button signals, first of all, they never work, right? They don't. They don't uh, in many cases, they actually aren't engineered to do anything except perhaps lengthen the cycle once you get going. Um, but they, no, that's true. But they, um, but mostly they're part. They're usually part of a larger regime in which the pedestrian isn't allowed to uh, have kind of <coughs> equality with the vehicle. But the kind of if you've been to New York City, and I think certain areas of Sydney, but not all of them, what works the best for pedestrians is the concurrent signalization. The car gets the green, you get the green. Ideally, you get the green three seconds first. It's called an LPI, a lead pedestrian indicator. But you get the green first, so you can claim the crosswalk before the cars start turning into it. But in New York City, you can walk for miles and never stop. Because if you can't cross this way, you can always cross that way. And most paths through grids are diagonal. So you can keep moving. And this idea that you stop and wait, like in Perth, for the scramble that allows you to claim the whole intersection. Oh, you know, wonderful. I can walk through the middle of the intersection. Isn't life grand? But in fact, you've had to wait 60 seconds for that experience. So a little bit about signals. So we're done with the big chunk now. The last two categories, very quick, but also essential. The comfortable walk has to do with, um, with how your body feels in space. And the idea that it's a little counterintuitive. Yes, we all love you know, deep vistas and broad views. Um, but the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. You want to be able to see your predators before they attack you. And you, wanna, you need to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. And if you don't feel that your flanks are covered in your bones, because you know, thousands of years of evolution have led us to this point, if you don't feel that your flanks are covered, you actually are not comfortable in a space. So our favorite spaces have both prospect and refuge. But a plaza is only as good as its walls. And a street is only as good as its edges. And we new urbanists have been talking about this for quite some time. Um, what's the ideal height to width ratio of a street space? Three to one is great. You know, one to one is the Renaissance ideal. Beyond one to six, you don't really feel enclosed anymore. And you know, six to one, Salzburg, is a delight. And of course, the opposite of Salzburg is Houston. Now, this is Houston years ago. Houston's doing so much better. But my purpose in showing you this slide is to remind you that it's the surface parking lot, which is the principal villain in this conversation. And whether it's the suburban parking lot in front of the corner store, which should be behind the corner store, or more likely the city block that has yet to be developed, um, that's when you turn around. Not that you'd be walking here at all, but if you were about here, you'd turn around and head back where you started. And then finally, the interesting walk. Um, spatial definition is important. This is the you know, rena Renaissance ideal. But you know, we humans were among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans. We want signs of humanity, or we will turn around. Um, this is in Grand Rapids, a very walkable downtown in Michigan. Uh, but this street, which connects the two best hotels, uh, is not particularly 
uh, favored because when you know one side of the street is an exposed parking deck and the other side is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that parking deck, <laughs> it's just not attracting. It's boring. We can't be bored. So the blank wall or the exposed parking structure is the problem. And Mayor Riley in Charleston, South Carolina, who just retired after 40 years, 10 terms as mayor, um, he taught us that it only takes about 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking. So have you set your building, have you set your parking lot back, your new parking structure, 20 feet, so you can put this building in front of it? Or have you done something like this in South Beach in Miami? I call this the Chia Pet Garage. But just you know, preserving historic storefronts that are activated with the garage above. Um, and then finally, you know, I was at the National Endowment for the Arts. I helped support a lot of uh, public art. This is what public art used to mean. This is also in Grand Rapids. This is the first grant the NEA ever gave was for this Calder sculpture. This is what public art used to mean, you know, plop art, the object of contemplation in the middle of the plaza, which, you know, if you're a connoisseur, might be of interest, but doesn't do anything remedial in terms of making unwalkable places more walkable. And I'm convinced that, that the best place to put your art dollars um, in a city that you want to be walkable is in those places where the blank walls and other things are uh, separating walkability and walkability. So you have a nice street over here and a nice street not too far away in this blank wall. That's where you should put your art budget. And that's, for example, where Philadelphia is putting a lot of their art budget. Beautiful murals all over town. I've seen a few in Sydney. Um, but for me, that's the best use of, of that money. This is the American version. Here's the European version. Um, but you, know, you need to take care of it, keep it clean. <laughs> so that is the list. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't apply this to something that's happening here beyond all the stuff that's happening here every day. So I was kind of interesting, interested in the West Connects conversation and this boulevard, what's it called? Parramatta. Parramatta? Parramatta Road, which currently is blighting all the real estate. This is kind of like the Embarcadero on the surface, right? This is nasty. It's a ton of cars. It's not very urban, and I'm sure it's really bringing down the value of all the property that's up against it. And as you know, you're spending $17 billion, $17 billion, putting it underground. You're replacing its capacity and then some underground, which gives you the opportunity to do whatever you want on the surface. And in fact, there was some proposals made. I'm not sure how I feel about the, the whole, but the fact is that if you're a pedestrian on this sidewalk, which is up against a two-lane street lined by parallel parking and street trees, this is a tremendous generator of real estate value. So you're turning from a highway, which is sundering real estate value, to a boulevard, which is generating real estate value. And by the way, when the Embarcadero came down in San Francisco, the increased tax revenues for the buildings lining the three miles that lost that highway just went through the roof, and they paid for the reconstruction in like three years, and they've been milking it ever since with increased tax revenues. So clearly this was an intelligent vision um, because, again, if all your capacity is put underground, then the surface road can be whatever it wants. Until the engineers, sorry, Arab, until the engineers, it wasn't Arab, came into the picture and said, no, our models tell us that there's going to be so much increased development around this road that it needs to have another six lanes on the surface with, by the way, no parallel parking. And, um, and by the way, any street that has a concrete two-foot median with no trees in it in the center basically communicates, again, that says highway. It doesn't say urban street. So you have a tremendous opportunity here to create real estate value, to create street life, to create more of the city that you want to be, which is being sundered by this um, solution. And I have to say, um, I see things like that all the time, but I'm particularly kind of morally driven to call attention to fiction, which is the pedestrians on this sidewalk. Because there will be, draw this if you want, you know, draw the architecture if you want, there will be no pedestrians on this sidewalk. So I think it's important to be honest in our renderings um, and to also revisit, if it's at all possible, to revisit the fact that why are you spending $17 billion if not, you know, if not to create something better than this, which this will not be. hate to end on a sour, sour, sour note. Um, 
So that's my talk. Here's my book, which I hope you will read. And um, uh, I'm on Twitter, which means my self-worth is a function of how many followers I have, so I do hope you'll follow me on Twitter. And uh, I'm Jeff Speck AICP. I share this also because uh, if you have any questions, want to continue the conversation afterwards, I am flying far away before too long, but I welcome uh, the conversation. And I welcome questions, which I understand are coming. So thank you for your attention.